I'm going to talk about Postgres, which is just as well at this conference. So this year is the 20th year of the formation of the uh, PostgreSQL project um, as an international global development group. So what I wanted to do was to look back right to the very start of Postgres and examine the development of Postgres over the years um, because that actually is a very good way of understanding where we're going to go uh, in the future. Because once you understand how much depth there has already been within the Postgres project, it, it allows you to understand and to explain to others why uh, we have so many features, why we have quality, and why we have uh, depth of understanding in the people in the Postgres community. So what I'd like to do is uh, go through uh, the set of releases um, that, uh, that Postgres has gone through. <clears throat> uh, now, if you're going to look at this tab here and say, Simon's got a tab out of place, I spent the last 15 minutes fighting with PDF technology, trying to remove that tab unsuccessfully. So even though Postgres is a very advanced database, unfortunately, PDF is, is not. Um, so. That's why we don't use the database. Yes, exactly. If, if only we were using a proper uh, data storage mechanism, it would be OK. So. So um, the, uh, the, the start of Postgres goes all the way back to university uh, Postgres, uh, which uh, started in 1986 with Michael Stonebreaker and uh, continues all the way uh, to the present day in an unbroken uh, time sequence. Uh, but it is a, a broken line of succession. Lots of different developers have worked on the code over the years. So as one person stopped, another one started. Uh, and I think it's quite interesting to see uh, that uh, while you might think that having continuity of developers is important, what's more important with an open source project is the code is out there, and if we don't develop it, somebody will. Okay, That's the first lesson we get uh, from the history of Postgres is that new people can join the project easily and continue that work. One thing I would like to do uh, at the very start is to highlight some of the Postgres forks that have uh, occurred over the years. Some of them have been successful, uh, some of them have not. Uh, and obviously it depends exactly what you mean by success. If uh, you define success as getting a lot of money for the people that did it, uh, then yes, some people have been successful. Uh, but in terms of long-term success, uh, as in uh, wide adoption in the industry, unfortunately none of the forks of Postgres has had anywhere near the success achieved by the main open source project. And I think that that is becoming clear over the years is that uh, the, the message is to people that want to fork Postgres is I you shouldn't because it's not going to lead to the success that you think it will uh, and as a result that you should contribute to the open source uh, code base for the core project and that's what uh, many of us have done over a long period of time, is contribute to core, but also to persuade other people to contribute to core. And one of the things that we've achieved over a long period of time is to avoid the problems that have occurred in other open source projects where they fragmented the developer team into uh, small groups and everybody's uh, you know, shown the finger to everybody else and said, oh man, you just don't understand and we're all going to run away. Um, so there are many differences of opinion in the Postgres community, but the continued strength of that community is that it's one community. 
And it's much better to argue in a room with people you disagree with than it is to just say a rude word and walk out of the room. So it's interesting to note that there have been so many Postgres forks and yet they have not been successful. So where did we start? Uh, 1986, we know uh, the history goes that a guy called Michael Stonebreaker um, uh, went back into the university to design a, a second generation uh, database. His first generation was called Ingres, and so he named uh, the one that came after Postgres, uh, the one that came after Ingres would be Postgres, and uh, so that name has stuck for all of this time. Now, interestingly, many years later, Michael Stonebreaker won the ACM Turing Prize for most influence on the industry, and he received $1 million for, what did he do? He created Postgres. That's what he received that money for. Now, it's very interesting and a bit of a shame that the man hasn't been involved in it for 20 years, but what is interesting is that his contribution was recognized in that way. And uh, so if we look back at what that contribution was, uh, the first design of Postgres was that it was a, a multiple CPU database. Now at the time, all other code ran on a single CPU. And if you wanted a program to go faster, you bought a faster CPU. Okay. And uh, that was the, uh, the old way of doing things. Uh, IBM sold you a mainframe, and if, they wanted, if you wanted it to go faster, then you bought the extra speed mainframe. Uh, so when multiple CPU systems were on the horizon, it was radical thinking to imagine that a database could run on multiple CPUs, and Postgres was the first. So in later years, when you look at Postgres and you go, that design is very strangely like Oracle. What you should do is actually turn that thinking around and say, isn't Oracle strangely like Postgres? Because that's the way round it was. That's where those ideas came from. The other thing that Postgres invented at that time was pluggable user-defined functions and data types, and that uh, decision at that point leads many years later to Postgres and PostGIS being the de facto standard for uh, geographical information systems worldwide. Uh, so this early thinking led directly to uh, that later dominance. Now, uh, also at that time, there were many advanced concepts introduced and the whole idea of Postgres as an advanced database system came into being. And that's something that stuck with us all of that time. But my characterization at this point in the early days was that Postgres was fragile, buggy, and incomplete in many ways. Uh, now, I can say that from a position of strength now, now that Postgres is not any of those things, it's okay to say in the early days it was fragile and buggy. Um, but I, I think it's worth understanding uh, that it was that so that we can understand what we have done as an open source community to change that. Because if you just imagine that somehow code springs up and it just doesn't have any bugs in it. That's definitely not the way it occurs. Okay. So Postgres 95 is where uh, a different group of developers take over from the ones who had been doing it at university. And for about a year, uh, a couple of guys worked on uh, Postgres 95, as they called it, and one of the major things they did at that time was to uh, change the database language from something called PostQL, um, which was similar to the Ingres language, over to SQL. 
uh, and they released some code and, and uh, did some useful things. But then they stopped, and this time, more developers took over. So at this point, this is now the third group of developers that have been involved in writing Postgres. And you see that that's very important, but because the code is open source, when one group of people decided they could no longer continue, another group stood up and continued that work. And I think that's a very important thing to understand because it's easy to imagine sometimes that if a meteor came down and destroyed this building right now that, that there would be no more Postgres project, but actually it would continue because there's copies of it on servers all around the world. And of course the excellent documentation, code comments and what have you would easily allow future developers to take over and continue that forwards. So we have um, not a, a longevity built in to the way that the project is managed. And that's what leads me to believe that it's almost impossible to stop the momentum that we, ha we now have with the project. So, uh, what happened after Postgres 95 was that the copyright was changed, uh, an international development group was formed and a mailing list was formed. And this is what people refer to as the start of the PostgreSQL project, because that's the name that was adopted at that time. So when we say to you it's 20 years old, what we mean is it's 20 years since 1996. But obviously at that point, it was already uh, roughly 10 years old uh, from its initial design work and the, uh, the elements of building. So depending how you want to measure it, Postgres is either 20 or 30 years old or somewhere in between, okay? Um, so it's kind of a little bit difficult to, uh, to measure the start of things. <clears throat> but that's normal because we're used to uh, people taking nine months to, uh, to arrive on the planet and uh, we measure things from our birthday, not from some other day. So the PostgreSQL 6 series uh, was one of the, the main periods of removing bugs. If you look at the old release notes, they didn't really contain new features. They just contained lists and lists and lists of bugs removed. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing to flip back through the release notes just looking at exactly how many bugs there were in the code. And um, yeah, so... Uh, at least we got to the stage where there were few enough bugs that we could record them all. That's quite a milestone in any software development project is where the software works sufficiently well that you bother to write down the bugs you fix, okay? That's, that's quite a, 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 a stable point in itself. So Postgres 6 introduced uh, SQL standard compliance multi-version concurrency control, uh, a JDBC driver, uh, a server-side procedural language called PLPGSQL, uh, and most importantly, multi-byte multi character set support. And the reason why that is important is it led to major adoption in Japan, and obviously that meant then uh, that wide international support uh, was possible because really previously to that it was very uh, oriented towards English language uh, uh, people and uh, at this point this is where the project becomes truly international and we start talking about having translations of the manual and, and just people from all over the world contributing. So that single thing, although it may not appear to be a major feature, it's actually uh, one of the reasons why we are here today. Otherwise, we probably would be all just talking uh, American uh, somewhere in Chicago and, and not very many people involved, whereas the whole world is now involved. So I've characterized this period of time as uh, the time where we became organized and we became international. So the Postgres 7 series releases 
uh, were starting uh, from uh, the millennium going forwards for the next few years. Most important uh, of the features that were introduced at that time for me uh, would be crash safety uh, because that's the, uh, the thing that matters most to people. There's no point having an accurate database if your data just explodes randomly. Um, so if you look at some of the other things that happened at that time, there were major performance improvements, but then that's something that's been happening for many years. Uh, the SQL optimizer was completely rewritten. So when we look at the optimizer the way it is now, you can see that that optimizer is 16 years old. That doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, sort of aging. Uh, what it means is it's reached full maturity. And I think that uh, when you look at how long it takes for an SQL optimizer to become strong, it's very clear that it takes it at least a decade to get to a point of maturity. Many other things were introduced at that point, and what I've characterized here is these releases were the first times when commercial developers started working on the code. So many of the major developers working on Postgres at this time were professionally employed, whereas in the Postgres 6 series, it was uh, very much a volunteer effort. Now, Postgres still attracts very many uh, volunteers to it, but this is the stage where professional development was driving the main project forwards. Uh, the Postgres 8 series uh, ran from 2004 to 2009, and uh, this is where we took another step up uh, towards uh, real maturity. Uh, one of the most important things we did uh, was expand the portability of the software. So Postgres runs pretty much on everything. Uh, it runs on Linux, AIX, HPUX, all sorts of things. Uh, obviously, all the, all the different flavors of BSD and such like, but eventually we had to come to terms with the fact that there's quite a bad Linux port uh, on offer in the world, um, which happens to be called Windows. And that took quite a lot of effort uh, to port Postgres to it, uh, but we were eventually able to do that. Now, once we'd achieved that, that's really when people took this seriously, because at that time, uh, Windows was completely everywhere uh, in business, and if you didn't run on Windows, then there wasn't much point being in existence. Uh, I think that that's probably changed somewhat over time, uh, but at that time, it looked like Windows NT would be the server operating system of choice for all of mankind, um, and so we needed to support Windows. Uh, but I think the main statement that we were making is that the Postgres project cared about portability and that we would go to extreme lengths to make sure that it ran on everything, okay? And I think that is particularly important. Now, when I say run on everything, obviously what you might uh, say is, right, but there's certain things it doesn't run on. It doesn't run in a browser and things like that. Well, that's because the goal of the project at this point was firmly set as a client-server database uh, aiming to solve real enterprise challenges. We could have gone in some other directions, and in fact, uh, round about this time, perhaps a little earlier, SQLite forked away from Postgres and actually became uh, a single session uh, database. So they actually based their original code on Postgres. Uh, in many ways it's quite different now, but that was, that was one of the things they did in early days. Now, uh, this is uh, the point where I myself became involved. Uh, what I've done in the rest of this presentation is really try to 
do it as a history of the project rather than a history of the people. Uh, so please forgive me if your name isn't on these slides. Uh, mine isn't either. Uh, so I, I uh, tried to make that as fair as possible to, uh, to remove the, move the credits and just look at the history itself. So uh, this was the first point where we had point in time recovery and the beginnings of in-core replication, though that itself would be a very long journey, taking from this point uh, about a, a, a further 10 years. Uh, but early gains in multi-CPU scalability meant that uh, Postgres's performance was well in advance of MySQL's performance for many years. And it was probably five or six years before MySQL even began to catch up. Now, it's very strange that at that time, the word on the street was that MySQL was the fast one, okay? Whereas actually the, the performance numbers were actually the opposite way around. So it was kind of like a, a very bizarre situation uh, that uh, we were known as the slow one, uh, yet could demonstrate some some fairly good performance graphs uh, to outperform people like MySQL. We introduced things like row-level locking, two-phase commit, and uh, most importantly for analytical tasks, we got things like window functions and recursive queries. Now, even now, most SQL developers can't write a Windows function, can they? Okay. Hold your hand up in the air if you know how to write uh, a query containing a window function or a recursive query. If you could write one down right now, just with a pen and paper, write that SQL out, okay? I mean, I'd know one if I saw one, but unfortunately, even with my experience, I have to get the manual out every time. Anybody else want to admit to not be able to, so I'll not put my hand up now. Who knows how to write those? A couple of people, okay? So <clears throat> what we're saying is this is the point where Postgres got so complex that you needed to look in the manual just to use it, okay? Now that's not a problem, that's not a difficulty of Postgres. It, what I'm saying is that the feature set of it became so non-trivial that we were able to address really remarkably difficult problems with it, okay? Now, I'm not embarrassed at all about that, about not being able to write one just off the, uh, you know, with a pen and paper. Uh, I see that as a mark of maturity of the software, that it's, it can do things so complex, you need the manual to, to let you uh, work out what that is, okay? That's what I call real depth and strength within uh, a software project. So at this point, uh, my characterization is that uh, Postgres became uh, mature, secure, fast, and popular. Um, so Postgres 8 was, was pretty good. 8.4 is still in use in many places, uh, even though it's gone out of support. So Postgres 9 uh, came out in September 2010, uh, si nearly six years ago. And this was really a pivotal release uh, in the sense that it was at this point that we introduced real-time streaming replication into PostgreSQL. At this point, uh, people had been arguing about doing this for years and years. And previously, at conferences, people gave talks on why it was impossible to get replication into Postgres and things like that, okay? Um, so this was uh, a major change of heart within the project to allow this. And at this stage, you see uh, a real maturity in the thinking of the development team because Almost every single person on the development team disliked Windows, and yet we supported it. And almost all of the original core members 
didn't think replication should go into Postgres, and yet it has done. Okay? And that shows that uh, people are able to be persuaded over time, and, and once the feature has sufficient, uh, a sufficiently good design and credible software to back it up, that the feature will go into Postgres. So although sometimes we find that features take a long time to go into Postgres, when they do go into Postgres, they go in big time. We delivered that high quality release, uh, very effective replication. And over the course of the next few releases, uh, we were able to add uh, a, quite a range of additional, uh, additional advanced features uh, surrounding that. So if you're thinking that uh, the only features in Postgres 9 were replication features, that's because this slide is all about that. I'm going to talk about some other stuff in a minute, okay? I do know that there were a couple of other features in there. Um, so the reason why this is particularly important, though, is that it's this feature set that really attracted uh, major enterprises to adopt Postgres because this is the point where people said, oh, Postgres has replication now, now it's ready for enterprise use. And not only did it have replication, but it had read replicas. Not only did it have read replicas, it had synchronous replication. And so that complete feature set was actually at the time and still is uh, well in advance of what you get with uh, other open source systems. Uh, so MySQL is still playing around with uh, other ways of doing it, uh, whereas we've got native physical replication that is extremely fast and very accurate. And this was the start of massive adoption of Postgres. And uh, when I say massive adoption, what I mean is almost every enterprise in the world now uses Postgres. Uh, probably 60% of them don't know it yet, uh, but they are somewhere using PostgreSQL. Whether they're using that within some embedded device they've bought from another company, or they're using it via a service that they purchase via one of the suppliers, somewhere within their organization, they're doing things that rely heavily upon PostgreSQL. They haven't, just admit, they haven't admitted it yet, but uh, they're definitely doing it, and the for example, the, uh, the number of financial uh, businesses that now rely upon PostgreSQL to manage their money is extremely high. And uh, I think that's a testament to the quality and the robustness of the server uh, software that we've, we've introduced. So that was a, a particularly important period uh, in Postgres history. Uh, the last few years, and uh, the early releases of Postgres 9 were uh, an era where we've introduced some extremely advanced uh, features. This is a time when we introduced things into Postgres that were not available in any other system. For example, Postgres 9.1 introduced true serializability. No other database uh, before Postgres was able to do that. And we translated uh, some PhD research in 2009 into a direct production implementation of that feature within a few short years. Uh, we also introduced k-nearest neighbor indexing and uh, that meant for certain GIS types of queries, Postgres was 10 times faster than its nearest commercial competitor. Uh, so those two features I like to cite as uh, being quite pivotal because that's the point at which we started to introduce things that nobody else had. Not just playing catch up with other systems, which is the way that people would like to see us, but where we're actually doing things, uh, advanced things, right from the get-go. Um, and this is also an era where we changed people's thinking uh, about what Postgres was. 
people had started to say that we were a relational database and that relational databases don't do things like holding key value stores and holding JSON. And actually, if you go to the MongoDB website now, you'll find some text about uh, relational databases being uh, you know, difficult to manage and all that kind of thing because they don't support this wonderful JSON. And actually, it took somebody about a week to add that uh, to, uh, to Postgres because it's just a data type, right? And we support uh, many different types of data type. Uh, but we've taken that further and actually uh, the JSON data type that we support has got better compression than MongoDB and there's more types of indexing than are available with MongoDB. So actually we've taken the idea uh, that was presented to us uh, from a different source, we've taken that idea into the heart of Postgres and we've done a better implementation of it. Okay, and I think those things are very interesting because they, they show you what the future is like is if somebody else has got a good idea in some other database or in some, uh, some other part of the world, we're able to take those ideas, put them into Postgres and uh, uh, allow wide adoption of that software as a result. So this is the period for me where we achieve enterprise maturity. <clears throat> so, um, I don't know how to, uh, do I speak more loudly to keep everybody awake? Uh, it's, uh, it's a hot time of day, isn't it? So, <clears throat> What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some pictures, much better than words, because uh, you weren't reading them anyway. So I've got some pictures for you uh, that tell you uh, what is coming in 9.6. So... Uh, there's a couple of interesting things that we've done in 9.6. Uh, aggregation has got faster. So there's a benchmark called TPCH, and the TPCH uh, uh, query has been speeded up considerably. Now, unfortunately, what I haven't got here is I haven't got a bar that says how fast 9.5 was, um, which is a shame because actually the speed difference between 9.5 and 9.6 without parallelism is considerably faster, okay? And that's because we, uh, we changed the way aggregation works in a couple of very subtle ways that lead to almost a, a factor of two improvement in performance, just that, okay? So that's the first gain, uh, but that is then the baseline for my comparison here because parallel query allows us to speed up that calculation even more. Now this particular task is interesting because this was previously a task where when you execute it, the CPU just glows at 100%, okay? So it doesn't matter how fast your disks are, it was CPU bound, okay? And that's exactly what we want here, is, to, is a way of uh, spreading the cost across multiple CPUs and executing that faster. So with multiple cores involved, we're able to speed up uh, the execution speed of Postgres. Wonderful. What is important about this graph is that I also include a comparison with Postgres Excel. Postgres Excel is available now, but the purpose of showing that to you here is that it shows we have a long way to go in terms of how much further we can make this thing go, okay? So there is more performance gains to be had, okay? So in the future, we're going to be going at that speed, okay? Not this speed. But you can see we're more than twice as fast when using parallel query, and we're faster than 9.5 just in itself. So we are already very significantly faster, and yet I say to you, we can go further, right? Next slide. <clears throat> this is showing OLTP performance on uh, five-minute runs uh, for read-only queries. And this is uh, a, a very large server 
with a very large number of cores uh, in there, 72 core server. And uh, what we have here are the first results. Are they the first results or are they the second results? I don't know. Uh, so uh, IBM uh, showed this morning uh, a graph uh, with the same test running at uh, a million transactions per second on one of their Power 8 servers. I didn't have a copy of that graph, but somebody else has run the test as well, and the stock version of 9.6 comes out at a million TPS. Okay? So this is the first time that we're able to hit that number. Now, I did a test for a UK customer some time ago, and they were saying, oh, it's not very fast, is it? So well, what do you mean? We're, we're hitting 330,000 transactions a second. How much does your application need? Oh, 100. So is that not fast enough? I go, oh, well, uh, maybe then, you know. So <clears throat> that's, that's strange. I mean, to me, this thing is so fast now that we can uh, do all sorts of applications that people never thought possible before. And we can do them with free and open source software on commonly available hardware. And I think that's a, a very important thing. The purpose of showing you this graph is that already in the labs, people have thought of ways of making the performance go even higher. So what I'm saying to you now is that you can see that very clearly in the near future, we're going to be making it go at 2 million transactions per second on that hardware. And of course, the hardware is getting faster every year, right? So it's not long before we're going to be hitting 5 million transactions per second and then 10 million, okay? So again, Postgres has got a long way to go, okay? Now, I'm not saying that because I want you to go away thinking Postgres well, isn't worth using yet. We'll use it in a couple of years. What I'm saying is 1 million TPS tells you that it's absolutely brilliant now, and yet I'm also telling you it's got a long way to go. So you can use it now. It exceeds your wildest expectations of performance, and yet more is still coming. <clears throat> and um, one other thing that I would show you now is uh, logical replication is available now as an extension called PG Logical uh, that plugs into the server and allows you to do uh, zero downtime upgrades and selective replication. And again, PG Logical is significantly faster than trigger-based alternatives. And at this point, we've got pretty much the full feature set of Bocado or Sloney. Um, so there's not many reasons why you shouldn't be using this now with the latest releases. And this actually works with uh, Postgres 9.4 and above. Uh, and you can see there that um, it's comfortably twice as fast possibly as much as four times as fast in uh, the, the way that it does replication. What does that mean? What it means is a very busy server can keep up with replication. Uh, one of the problems of replication is uh, that if your write traffic is too high and the replication system can't keep up with it, then you don't have an effective high availability um, system. So high performance from your replication system is not just interesting, it's actually a critical requirement. Okay, and that's what uh, we're getting here. Now the difference between the red line and the blue line is that logical performance is not yet as fast as physical streaming replication. And so what I'm saying to you is, again, right now we have great performance and a great feature set, but there is more to come in the future.
okay? So my last three slides were showing you that it's really cool now, but there's more to come in the future. And so what I can say to you is that the development team has agreed that the next release of Postgres will be called Postgres 10, and it will be available in September 2017. And uh, in all of the areas of parallel query, CPU scalability, and logical replication, we have made massive gains, but there are still many good things to come in later releases. Uh, so uh, the, the track of development, the arc uh, of the way that the project is progressing uh, is on track to, uh, to really bring in some very important changes over the next couple of years. So when somebody says to you, how fast is Postgres? Do not answer with one number, okay? This is a journey and we're on a journey upwards, okay? So don't think of it as where we are now. Think about where we're going to be by the time you need that performance. Now, I know that there are some people in the room that already run very high traffic systems, okay? Uh, but I also know that you are not yet at the latest releases. 9.6 is still in beta, so this performance will be available to you soon, okay? Uh, but beyond that, we have even more performance, uh, even greater feature set uh, to come. And uh, one of the interesting things that's happened this year is that uh, for the first time, multiple companies have published uh, roadmaps about what they intend to work on. Um, and that is wonderful for a couple of different uh, reasons. First of all, we have multiple companies involved, not just one or two, okay? Uh, so we've got um, multiple independent, fully funded development groups working on Postgres. So there's a little bit of competition there. That's very nice. Why is competition good? Because it's, it leads us to succeed well, right? Uh, when you don't have proper competition, you don't try your best. So competition is a good thing. Also, we've got multiple groups involved, which means that if for some reason one of the groups was shut down, the others would still continue, right? So we've got competition, we've got high availability worked naturally into the development process, and you can see we've got a long way to go. And because the source is, uh, is open, what I've shown before is that even when nobody was working on the code, other new people came in and picked up the code and ran with it. So what I'm saying to you is that Postgres has got a long way to go and there's absolutely no way that anybody's going to stop that from happening. Okay? So we are going forward with huge momentum and there isn't anybody that's going to be able to come in and block it or stop it in any way. Okay, so it's a, a huge steam train going forwards very quickly and uh, anybody that tries to get in its way is going to get smashed out of the way. Okay, and I think that's a very important message to show that the project has an enormous future. And uh, so I, I don't know what the release numbering is going to be in the future. I don't know whether in 2018 it's going to be release 11 or release C or something, I don't know, or whatever they come up with. But um, what I do know is that uh, next year it's going to be release 10 and uh, a change of number like that is always going to be uh, an important thing because it's sending out a, a big message to the world that the project is changing and that the project is growing uh, as we go. So this presentation in the past I've used as an opportunity to tell people about the things that uh, Second Quadrant are working on or other, com uh, other companies are working on. But I don't think that's appropriate really for now because the, the large number of new features and ongoing projects that's out there is so impressive 
that I really just don't think it would fit on one or two slides. And if I did try to describe some things, somebody would say, well, you, you missed out this or you missed out that and that kind of thing. So really for the first time, I can say there's so many things going on, I can't tell you all about them, okay? And again, that's uh, a very exciting place to be. So uh, Postgres now is where I think it is, is it's reached full enterprise maturity. There is absolutely nobody now that will lose their job for suggesting Postgres, right? And that's the way that uh, the world works. Uh, if you go to your boss now and say, yes, I can do it with Postgres, you're safe, okay? You're very safe making that comment. Uh, but what's even better is that in the future, uh, that is going to make you look like a superhero when you suggest it, because it's gonna come out with a great feature set and you're just gonna look like the cleverest guy on the team, right? So what could be better than that? It's great now and it's getting even better in the future. So uh, that really is my message uh, on this hot and sweaty afternoon, is that uh, uh, the world is pretty good now and it's gonna get even better, okay? Um, so, uh, maybe there's some questions, but uh, if not, I'll just say thank you very much for uh, coming to Milan. Some people have come a long way, some people have come just a short distance, uh, but everybody here is involved in the Postgres project. Uh, you're part of the Postgres environment, the Postgres ecosystem, and uh, so your usage of Postgres uh, is as important as the people that are writing it. Uh, so everybody's involved in making this project the huge success that it now is internationally. So uh, thank you very much. Do we have questions? Let me get you the microphone. Um, so you've made a, a very impressive case for the technological benefits of, of Postgres, but um, in enterprise context, it's not always the IT uh, person or architect who is making the decisions of whether to go with one technology or the other. Uh, very often it's somebody who's a little bit more concerned also about support and um, uh, whether bugs are fixed quickly, um, things like that. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, I'm kind of new to the community, so I don't know, other than Second Quadrant, what other types of, or how big the community is that uh, provides professional services, for example. And an analogous case or to compare to is JBoss, which um, exists both as a community version, but also is supported by Red Hat which is offers a, an enterprise support uh, yeah. regime. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um, well, what I was going to uh, start with, really, was to, to say that uh, there are multiple companies involved. Obviously, I work for Second Quadrant. I hope you've got that. Um, but, but there's uh, a number of different options out there. And I think one of the strengths of the PostgreSQL project is that it's supported by multiple companies. Now, that is very important because in terms of vendor lock-in, uh, all of the companies that we've spoken to say that they want to move away from commercial software that locks them into a single vendor because in the past, those vendors have used that as an opportunity to overcharge and deliver poor service and such like. So what is important is that multiple companies are backing the Postgres project, okay? Now, it is a strange thing for me to say to you that uh, you might not want to pick Second Quadrant as your support vendor, okay? But I see that as a strength of the situation rather than as a weakness of the situation 
Because if you know that if Second Quadrant got taken over or went out of business or people died or something like that, there would still be other opportunities. Um, now, second sourcing, as it's called, uh, is uh, something that's keenly observed by purchasing departments. So I think if you introduce uh, Postgres and the way it truly is to the purchasing department, they would see that it comes in as a uh, low-cost license, plus you have a choice of multiple vendors uh, to pick for your support options. Now, the, the way that the community works is that we do fix bugs, but the community fixes, uh, the, the community releases are every three months. So if you've got a bug fix that you want on a quicker uh, timeline than that, uh, then you really need to be looking towards a, a support vendor uh, to provide that for you. Um, and obviously, if people can fix bugs themselves, then uh, that's obviously a key criteria for selection. Um, it, so it, it appears uh, to be a weak spot in uh, the open source project, but I view it as a strength. Uh, and I actually know that there are many people in the audience today from other commercial organisations uh, other than Second Quadrant, for example. So um, the, almost all of Second Quadrant customers have said to me when I've spoken to them personally that this ability to choose from a second source is crucially important to their choice of Postgres uh, because it avoids vendor lock-in. So, that's why I myself have advocated that, even though while you might think that I would wish to rub out the competition, uh, it's, the, it's the existence of competition that makes this an interesting environment. I hope that was a full answer. Thank you. We have more questions. Go back in the room, of course. <laughs> Honestly speaking, I don't have uh, the question directly to you, but uh, I just wanted to refer to you to the question from the audience. So, um, as you said, one of the options of support uh, is to choose second quadrant, but keep in mind that Fujitsu exists also on the market as a, not only as a um, company who provides you first-line support in terms of open source or enterprise Postgres solution, which Fujitsu has in their portfolio, but also supports you in terms of migration. And uh, so you can also consider to, to choose our company as a partner for such a project. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> Do we have more questions somewhere? In the front <coughs> or in the back of the room? I have a question, which is, why is lemonade with ice cubes not served during this conference? So it's so hot. I'm not sure if it's not served in the coffee break we will have now. Okay. And <laughs> that's an excellent closing. Thank you very much, for Simon. Please give me a big hand.